thank you, Daisy. You are so very kind and it is always a pleasure to see you. I have no idea how I'm supposed to follow on from Marina. That was the most amazing uh, presentation that she gave and so poignant, so important that it almost feels that what I have to say is, is kind of irrelevant almost. It's a little bit of, um, I'd like to say light relief, but my life as an anatomist and a forensic anthropologist isn't often viewed by many as being light relief. And as you've said very kindly, this is the second book that I've written in this sort of genre, which is looking at the, the interaction between every normal day life for me, but also my profession, which is really rather unusual for most people. With Written in Bone, what I wanted to do, because I, I believe as an anatomist and a forensic anthropologist, often we have very little lexicon about our own body, very little understanding of where our different bits are. And so part of what I wanted to do as an expert witness in the court is to talk to the public about themselves, making them think about their own bodies. And let's face it, in a time where we're locked down with not an awful lot to do, the exercises that we do of our mind as well as our body become incredibly important. But for those of you who are overseas, what I'm going to say next probably won't make much sense. But for those of you in the UK who are at least my age, it will. In the, <clears throat> in the 1970s, we had a television program, a truly dreadful television program, which was called The Generation Game. And it was run by a host who was called Bruce Forsyth. And one of the, the games that they used to play was they would put out an outline of the human body and the contestants had to draw in where they would find their liver or their stomach or their kidneys. And it was amazing to me as an anatomist, just how little we know about our own bodies. And certainly if you go into a GP or you speak to somebody who's come out of a GP or the hospital and you say, what did they tell you? Often what patients will say is, I don't really know because I didn't understand. And much of that lack of understanding is simply because we have that difference in a lexicon. We have a slightly different language going on in a medical phase than we have in our normal public life. So what I wanted to do was to bring the body into people's vision, to use all the right words, but to use it in a way that helps us to understand our body, perhaps just that little bit better. One of my areas of expertise is in criminal dismemberment. And what I mean by that is it's my job when a body is, is placed into parts to be able to determine what sort of implement might have been used to put that body into parts, whether the individual was lying face down or on their back, which limb was removed first. And all of that means that we know frequently in terms of our cases that we won't always find a complete body. So the purpose of the book, in my background, my head, was to say, I want to talk about anatomy and forensic anthropology, but I want to do it in a way that is straightforward to understand. And I'm going to use the concept of criminal dismemberment. So I'm going to take each section of the body and I'm going to look at it in isolation, whether that's the head or it's the limbs or it's the hands, it's the feet. And in looking at that particular part of the body in quite a detailed lens in some parts, what I'm also going to do is show you how certain cases that I've worked on in the past, that area of the body is particularly relevant to what we're looking at. And it may have been that it was that part of the body that helped to unravel the mystery or the crime. It was that part that helped to solve it, or perhaps it was the only part of a body that we were able to identify. Now, not knowing my audience, normally you can look out across the sea and you can see the audience and you know how people are responding to you. And it's a really alien environment to be in front of a screen, not able to see anybody else's faces, because you can usually judge when you've gone a little bit too far in the field of forensic anthropology. So I thought what I would do is I'd choose a section of the book tonight that we're all comfortable with. And we're all comfortable with two parts of our bodies because they're the parts of our bodies that we're prepared to show everybody on a daily basis. It's either our face or it's our hands. So I thought, well, I'll look at something from the hands section of the book. But then what I'll do is I won't use anything that is too difficult because I don't know the age of my audience and I can't look you in the eye. So I'm going to just give 
a little bit of a background on one of the cases that will give you some of the idea of the kinds of things that I looked at. And usually what happens is that a police investigation for me starts with a phone call. And it's a phone call that comes through to my secretary and she says, I've got a police force on the phone for you. And you never know what that's going to turn into. And interestingly, a number of police forces often start with, I know this is a little bit strange. And at the end of the day, we have seen the most ludicrous and ridiculous cases that you couldn't even possibly imagine as a crime fiction writer, because much more often, actually fact is much stranger than fiction. So I had a phone call one day and Daisy's going to find a slide for me, I hope, which she's going to be able to put up on the screen for you. And the police turned up with a little evidence bag and inside the evidence bag, they had this. And what the police were dreadfully hoping for was that this was going to be something that was a joke. It was something from a Halloween it was not going to be anything for them to investigate. Well, that was the point at which we burst their bubble. So this is a key fob, obviously, but it's a key fob of considerable difference because this is the distal, the middle, and part of the proximal phalanx of a right index finger. Now, the first thing the police want to know is, is this human? And unquestionably, this is human because there is no animal where the, the digits look exactly like this and in that order because they fit together. They're from the same individual. When you look at primate hands, primate hands can look very similar, but they are still different to the human. So we know that this is human. Is it forensic, they asked, or is it archeological? Well, it hasn't been buried because it doesn't have the dark coloration that you normally get associated with bone that's been buried. So we were pretty sure that it was probably going to be relatively recent. We can measure some of the bones and it tells us that it's come from an individual who is most likely to be male. And when we take an x-ray of it, what we can see at the ends of the bone are little growth plates that have only just finished growing. And so if this is male, then it's going to come from somebody who's probably around 16 to 18 years of age. Now, because you have that finger doesn't mean that the individual is dead. Of course, as you know, you can have an amputation and survive quite readily. So what the police did was they'd found this, a walker um, out with a dog, as always people walking dogs, had found this and brought it into the police station. And I said, what you really need to do is you need to go around door to door and you need to find a young man who's missing his left index finger. Now, if you can't find that, then maybe we're gonna to have to look at something a little bit more nefarious that's been going on. But the chances are there's gonna be somebody around there who doesn't have a finger. And of course they knock on the door and a young man opens the door and his name is David and wonderfully he's missing the index finger on his hand. And he admits that in fact the key fob is his. Now that should be the end of it. But what's really interesting is to say, well, why? have we got a key fob that has a finger on it? And this is where so often the fact of what we see in a police case is so much more ridiculous than any fiction. Obviously there's no crime to investigate, but let me tell you what happened. He was a 16 year old boy at the time. He's now a 23 year old man. And as a 16 year old boy, he worked for his father um, in his carpenter shop. And he was in a hurry one day whilst he was cutting wood and he didn't put all the necessary safety guards that he should have done onto the band saw, a circular saw that he was using. And he literally amputated by accident his own finger. He was taken to A&E and at A&E, he somehow managed to persuade them to allow him to keep his own finger. Now there is no law against that. I don't know that it's necessarily something that you should advocate that anybody should do, but he was allowed to keep his finger. So he took home his finger and he decided and knew that he couldn't keep it forever because it was going to go off. So he thought, well, what I'll do is I'll do what my mum does. She puts bones into water and boils them when she's making soup. So if I boil my finger, then I can get rid of all the soft tissue and I'll just have the bones left. And for a 16 year old, that apparently seemed to be cool. So he boiled his finger and he laid it out on some, some toweling and he noticed that it wasn't, still wasn't smelling very nice after a few days and it was still oozing a little bit of fat. So he then knew that when his mother um, had 
oils or fat that she needed to get her clothing. What she did, she boiled it with some detergent. So he popped his finger bones back into a pan with some detergent and boiled them up again. And then he thought to get them a little bit cleaner, he would drop them into bleach, into household bleach, because he knew that made things white. Isn't it wonderful that you can think about so many things that go on in a normal moment in life and relate it back to something unusual like this? So he then took his finger bones and he put them on a paper towel on his windowsill and he let them dry in the sun for a number of weeks. They were perfectly dry. He didn't know what to do with them. So he popped them in a little glass vial and he left them there. And every now and again on things like Halloween, he'd take them out because he thought it was a bit cool to show his friends down in the bar that these were his, his finger bones. But he then decided that he wanted to make some jewellery out of his own finger bones and he made them into the key fob that you just saw. Now, all of that is weird enough, but then he did something that went too far. He decided that this would make a wonderful Valentine's Day present for his girlfriend. I think she was probably expecting diamonds or she was expecting roses, but what she got was a fob made out of his finger bones. I think she, at that point, took great umbrage. It was probably the end of their entire relationship and she threw it away. And at that point, he was distraught. He'd lost his finger. She'd thrown it away only for it to be found by a dog walker and then found and taken by the police to a forensic anthropologist before it could get back to him. Now, if you put that in crime fiction, nobody would believe you. But the world of anatomy and the world of forensic anthropology is a strange place. And we need to be able to interpret any part of the human body that we find with the maximum amount of detail. So whilst his finger and his finger bones forever will remain at 16 years of age, as he gets older, the only thing we can hope for is that perhaps he will gain a little bit more sense. And in future, when he buys Valentine's presents for his wife or his girlfriend or whoever it may be, that perhaps he develops a little bit more taste. So at the end of the book, what I really want everybody to do is to feel comfortable about talking about their own body parts, about the variation in it, the wonderful variation that is the human body. And sometimes to take the cases very seriously, but sometimes, like David with his missing finger, to really enjoy the ludicrous nature that is the human being. Thank you, Daisy.